Amen, amen. You may be seated this morning. And I get the privilege of continuing in this awesome series we have started about the fire spreading. And you know how sometimes maybe you have an intention on starting out saying something to someone, and then sometimes something changes and you say something else? Well, I feel like instead of jumping right in, I felt led by the Holy Spirit to share something with you this morning. And it's partly what I felt called on my heart to pray for before this service started. If you don't realize it now, you are sitting in a matchbox. You know, old school matches, not the flame sticks, but matchbox with matches. And each one of us, whether you realize it now or not, is a match that's just waiting to be lit by the power of the Holy Spirit to spread the fire of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. In areas that you have influence in your family, your friends, your coworkers, wherever you may head to, today as you leave this place, wherever your adventure, wherever your life takes you this week, you have the potential to be lit for Jesus, to be lit and to sp spread the fire of the gospel message to those around you. At District Conference, we were made aware, again, painstakingly aware again, that the population of the world is outgrowing the spread of the gospel right now. There's so many people and the great of growth in our world is so much far seceding anything that we're doing to spread the gospel. And this morning, I think God is calling us to be lit, to spread the gospel, to be emboldened with power from the Holy Spirit, to spread the message of Jesus Christ to those that are around us, not with a Bible thumping them on top of the head, not with a picket on a street corner yelling at people walking by, but in love and in wisdom, empowered by the Holy Spirit to be bold and kind reaching out to people that aren't like us and sharing the good news of Jesus with them. Because I don't know if you realize it this morning, but there is a world out there that is dying, that is un painstakingly unaware of the hope of Jesus Christ that we are here gathered this morning to celebrate, that we have received forgiveness, that we have an eternal destination to be with him for all time. And there are people that need to know, they're dying to know. And so this morning, I'd encourage you to think about yourself as a match in a match box this morning, just waiting, being willing to be lit on fire for Jesus and help the fire spread. Hopefully this morning you brought your Bible with you. If you don't have your Bible, there are Bibles in front of you in the pew. And if you don't own a Bible, we'd love to give one to you. And, and if you don't want a papery Bible, if you have a smartphone, which most, a lot of people do in this day and age, there's an awesome YouVersion Bible app that you can download with all the translations you could ever want and devotionals and all sorts of exciting stuff. So if you need help doing that, we'd love to do that and love to give you a paper Bible too. But if you brought your Bible, this is a key to life. This is the word of God, active, breathing, inerrant. We believe in this thing more than anything that I have to say. This is a truth that we claim and we believe here at Westland Community Church. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and hold it up in the air loud and proud. Oh, that's awesome. All right, say, I've got my Bible, PK. Got my Bible. All right, all right, amen. That's wonderful. Go ahead and get ready. We're going to dive back into the book of Acts in chapter 19. We're going to be picking up in verse 23. And today we're going to be talking about standing against opposition, standing against persecution, against the Christian faith, against our walk with Jesus. And before we dive in, I just wanted to share a story that comes from one of our missionary partners that we support here at Wesleyan Community Church. We support an organization called Voice of the Martyrs. And what they do is they support those that are in the persecuted church around the world. And if you were to go to the, to the website right now, you'd see a story on there about a woman named Amina from Nigeria. And this woman, a Christian woman, had heard in her village of Muslim gangs basically coming through and finding out where there were Christian villages or Christian people going through pillaging the village and killing and slaughtering people around. And they had not come 
to her village. Amina was pregnant and was in her house one day when all of a sudden she heard shouts outside of her home. And she realized today was the day that her village was going to be attacked. Her and her friends tried to make a quick escape out the back door and tried to climb up a fence to their freedom. But unfortunately, pregnant Amina was climbing up the fence and one of the attackers shot her in the leg and shattered her leg, rendering her helpless to get over the other side of the fence. So her and her friend ran back inside her home and hid inside a closet, holding their breath, hoping that they would not be found. Unfortunately, because of her shattered leg, the attackers found the trail of blood and, and led to the closet. And because of the uh, grossness of what happened next, I'll spare you some details, but the attackers continued attacking and Amina landed in the hospital. Amazingly, they overlooked her friend that was nearby and so her friend was able to get her help and the Nigerian army came and put her in the hospital. And so she's there, leg is shattered, pregnant, unfortunately delivers a stillborn baby because of the injuries that she had endured from her attackers for believing in Jesus Christ. Voice of the Martyrs stepped in and started helping cover the medical costs of all this and started sending in counselors to help her with the post-traumatic stress and, and the grieving process and, and helping her in this time. Her husband, a little bit after the event, said, Amina, what, what would happen today if your attackers were brought before you, what would you do? It wasn't that long after the event, and she looked at her leg, and she said, I would wish the same upon them. That's our human response, right? That, that seems only right. I would, we would probably all, in our honesty, wish the same thing upon someone that would attack us. Months later, after counseling and realizing how God had forgiven her in her broken state, in her dirtiness, in her sin, and being reminded of his love for her, she was asked the same question, in which she replied, in realizing God's forgiveness of my sins and my brokenness, I would do the same for them. I would offer forgiveness to them because they, even though maybe I was undeserving and they're undeserving, God forgave me and he calls me to do the same. Now it's very unlikely that you or anyone that you know have gone through such an ordeal. You may not personally know a martyr. You may not personally know someone who has been attacked physically in such a way. But if you look and you do a little bit of research in our country, we realize that there is a lowering tolerance of the Christian faith. There's less knowledge of the Christian faith. And some people believe that persecution is on the increase in our country, which begs us to question, what are we going to do? What are we going to do if it continues to increase? What is our stand against the opposition that we will face in some form or another? Now we pray, of course, we pray fervently for our brothers and sisters around the world that are persecuted, that they would no longer receive such brutal persecution. And we pray that here in America, we would never reach such levels and endure such levels of persecution. But what if they reached that level? What would I do in response? Would I back down in fear and sink into the, the folds of the world and kind of go, oh, oh, Jesus, who is he? Would I deny Jesus or, or would I take a stand against opposition? And what would that stand against opposition look like? This morning, I think the passage that we have kind of gives some insight to us about opposition that we will face in our life as a Christian. And so today, I would like to start reading in verse 23. But first, I just want to kind of pick up where we left off last week. Last week, we heard that Paul had been uh, spreading the word about Jesus. The gospel message was spreading. And there were these seven sons of Sceva, right? If you were here with us last week, you heard about these seven sons of Sceva that were trying to cast out demons using the name of Jesus in whom Paul preached. But they didn't internally know this Jesus. They weren't living for Jesus, but they were going around casting out demons in Jesus' name whom Paul preached. And one day they encounter a man who is possessed by a spirit. And that spirit is wise onto what they're doing. And he calls them out on it. He says, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. 
but who are you? And the spirit that embodied this man attacked these sons of Sceva. And what happens as a result that we heard last week is that people realize the power that there is in Jesus Christ. And in this time in Ephesus, there was sorcery, there was magic, there was idols and shrines to other things other than Jesus. And what ended up happening is people gathered together and brought school, scrolls of spells and they burned them. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal to us today. It just sounds like pieces of paper, you know, type up a document in a word and, you know, throw it in the fire. No, these were scrolls that were valued at about $15 million back in that day. They burned and they sacrificed all of that because they realized the power of Jesus. They realized that they needed this Jesus in their lives. And so the fire spread. And Paul, seeing this and, and being in this, he says, okay, it's time for me to move on. But first, this is what happens next. So in verse 23, we pick up. And it says, about that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way of Jesus or the Christian church. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together along with workers in related trades and said, you know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is a danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. Well, when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they excuse me, all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is a guardian of the temple, the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are pro -counsels. They can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. Well, here we have this story of a riot that takes place in Ephesus right before Paul's getting ready to leave as the word of God spreads, as a fire is spreading. And there's this man named Demetrius who is this silversmith and his way of making money, his way of doing business is making silver shrines to the goddess Artemis who was celebrated all around Asia. And there was, in Ephesus, was the temple of the great goddess Artemis. It was actually considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was beautiful. It was a place that they came to worship and, and a lot of things were done there. And, and this was his way of making money, was making these shrines. And he's seeing these people burn these scrolls, right? $15 million and the word of God spreading. And he's like, oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to lose the money here. So he riles up his tradesmen and says, we can't lose money. This guy, Paul's doing this, and this is horrible, and we've got to stop him. So they get this huge riot, and they rush down to the theater, which held approximately 24,000 people, they believe. They don't know if it was quite filled that day, but there were thousands of people in this place with Paul's traveling companions, and, and there were there were 
there just screaming and shouting. And like the text says, somebody didn't even know why they were there, but they were just riled up in this riot. You know, we see that happen today. And they're there, and, and Paul is told to hang back. And so he hangs back, and, and it's interesting because the city clerk, the mayor of Ephesus, speaks up and says, y'all are out of hand. There's a way to go about this, and you guys are going to bring trouble upon yourselves. It, it's time to go home. You can go about this a legal way. Go home. And it's kind of an odd situation, and, and, but what is happening is the fire is spreading. The fire is spreading about the gospel. And whenever that happens, Satan knows he's already lost the battle, the ultimate end battle. And when the fire spreads, he looks at it and he goes, okay, the only thing I have a chance to do is to stop its spread, right? To get out my big old hose and put a stop to this fire. And so he'll do anything he can. And this is one of his attempts using money and the fear of losing money to put a stop to this. And so what we see is this riot that takes place. And we see a couple of players in it. We see Alexander who's pushed to the front to make a defense upon the, on the, the way, but really he's a Jew. He's not a follower of the way. And the people quickly realize this and drown him out and say, well, he doesn't matter. He's not a follower of the way. He's not doing what Paul's doing. He's not believing what Paul's doing. So eh, forget about him. And they get even louder and shout for two more hours. Great is the goddess of Artemis of the Ephesians. What we can learn from this passage are two things. First thing is opposition will happen as a Christian. Opposition will happen as a Christian. The advances were being made for the gospel in Ephesus. Satan was already attacking prior to the riot. He was already trying to stop the advancing of the gospel message. But this was kind of like his, his last attempt before Paul leaves to put a stop or slow it down in Ephesus. As Christians, we are little Christ. We have Jesus, literally his spirit, living inside of us. Did Jesus walk this earth without experiencing any questioning, without experiencing any mocking, beating, scourging, persecution, death? No. So why would we expect that with Jesus living inside of us that we too would never face any of those things? It only makes sense. It's only logical if Jesus is living inside of us that we will face, potentially face, and should face the same things that he faced when he walked this earth. That's a big deal. It's not. <laughs> when we come to Christ, sometimes we don't think about that side of things, right? We kind of think, oh, Jesus saved me. I'm so thankful. And we should. And Jesus loves me, and he calls me, and he has a purpose for me, and we should, and he does. But there is a risk involved in standing for the truth of the gospel, in spreading the fire, which we are called to do. We're called to go and make disciples of all nations. That's our commission that Jesus left us with. And as a part of that, there are the good sides, but there are some things that we'll face we will face opposition in some form or another if we are a Christian. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10 says, We are pressed, hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Jesus is inside of us, and these things will happen to us. But notice what is said. We won't be in despair. We won't be crushed. We won't be abandoned, and we won't be destroyed. We may face these things, but because Jesus is inside of us, his life lives inside of us too. He never abandons us, and so we have no reason to despair or to abandon our faith or to leave it. That's good news this morning, right? <laughs> For us as a Christ follower, if, if we are taking on this journey and we are following Jesus and spreading his word, even though opposition will happen, he never leaves us. We will not be destroyed. 
The second thing we learn is that opposition should happen as a Christian. I already alluded to this. Opposition will happen as a Christian is only logical. It's only logical. Jesus lives in us and Jesus faced it. We should, we will face it too, but it should happen. And if you are here today this morning and you claim Jesus Christ as your personal savior, I want to ask you to do a little self-reflection. When's the last time you faced any type of opposition to your faith? Was it during a holiday meal when you sat around the family table and, and that family member that makes fun of you because you believe in Jesus or maybe they didn't even show up this past year because they knew you were going to be there because you're going to be talking about how much you love Jesus? That's opposition. Maybe it was at, at work and you were going on lunch break and maybe everyone sat on one table and, and started talking and you were alone at a table all by yourself and you realized the reason that they didn't want to talk with you is because you had your Bible out or you're looking at it on your phone, that's opposition. But if you're here this morning and you can't think of the last time that something, somebody or someone opposed you, you might want to do a little bit of soul searching. You might want to pray and reflect on where you are at, who is really sitting on the throne of your life, who you are really serving. Because if you are serving Jesus and he is who you are living for and he is living inside of you, it is only natural for that to flood out and to come out and for you to share that just like if you go to a fantastic restaurant this afternoon and you go and you tell people about man they have great food it is something that is a part of you it should leak out and when it leaks out and when we're intentional in sharing we'll face some sort of opposition it's only a natural response and if we're not we need to think about where our heart is with the lord and who we're really serving and what we're really passionate about in this life Paul speaks to Timothy about this in, sec, or in 2 Timothy, where he encourages him that even though he is persecuted as he should be, he should continue doing what, is, what he is doing in spreading the gospel. He says in 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 15, he says, you, however, Timothy, know all about my, Paul's teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So he says, Timothy, you've seen my life. You've seen how much I've been persecuted, yet the Lord has rescued me. In fact, I'm telling you, Timothy, and all those who call themselves Christians, if you live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will face persecution. You should face persecution, but you should keep on pressing on. You should remain faithful because the Lord promises to rescue you. So if we're supposed to continue standing firm in, this faith, in, in our faith, standing firm in the gospel, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, and we will face opposition to some level or degree. How do we stand up against it? The first thing that we see, or that I believe that we need to do, is sometimes we, we just need to speak up. Now, in this particular passage, it's interesting, because the person that you think would come and speak up doesn't come and speak up, right? Paul, he hangs back. He trusts some advice of friends, and he hangs back. So we don't see Paul coming forward and, and speaking on behalf of the way. We don't see him doing this. But we do see the mayor speaking up. He's not a follower of the way, but he speaks up. But <laughs> there are times to speak up. And, and I think sometimes we get in the practice of speaking up in the wrong ways. We don't speak up in the right ways or the best ways. And I kind of liken this, or I, I see this example in social media a lot, where we have grown very used to hiding behind a screen. And we feel safe behind the screen. And we feel like we can say anything we want to behind a screen, to whoever we want to behind a screen. Some people are more careful than others, but some people get kind of fired up. 
And I see a lot of times I'll, I'll see something, whether it's about religion or politics or combining the both, and I'll, I'll look and I'm like, no, 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 why are you doing this? This is not the wisest way. This is not a bold way. This is not how Jesus wants us to stand up for our faith. It's not to fight, it's not to pick fights or be bullies. It's to be wise. It's to be wise and say things in love and address people as a fellow common man, someone created in the image of God that God loves and sent his son to die for, not to send some meme with some sarcastic comment on it in defense of your faith, not to go on and say something and battle back and forth with someone you don't know. There's not great influence there. It's only feeding a disease, in my opinion, is only feeding the problem. There's this old school thing called conversation, face-to-face -face conversation, which I would encourage you. In all the ways that we can stand against opposition, we need to pray first, right? We need to pray and ask God for guidance to know how to stand up for our faith in certain, in certain situations that we are in. And if he leads us to speak up, I implore you, have a conversation face-to-face. -face. Call them up on the phone and, and, and say, I know we disagree on some things. I know that Thanksgiving is coming up, and I'd love to be able to sit with you as a family member. And you know what? I love you. And I have some different beliefs than you do. I know we don't see eye to eye, but I love you. And I think it is possible for us to sit together and have a conversation, a civil conversation, because that can happen between people of two differing opinions, politically, religiously speaking, whatever. You can sit down and have a conversation with another person out of love and respect and share your thoughts. And if God leads you to have that conversation with someone, you address it out of love. You say, let's have coffee. Let's come together. Let's share with one another. Whether it's somebody that you've told a million times about your faith or maybe you've never told about your faith, it is possible to sit down and have a conversation. And if you're just, you're kind of timid, pray about a mediator. Maybe there's, maybe there's that really rough situation that has happened and, and you just can't fathom being in the same room with that person. Those things happen, we're human. Unfortunately, those things happen. Pray about it. Ask someone that maybe they respect and, and and you respect, and that is kind of in, in the middle, that say, hey, can you just come in and help guide this conversation and help us keep the peace? That's a, that's a biblical way of doing things. That is the right way of doing things. It's not standing on a corner with a picket sign. It's not with a bullhorn. It's not yelling at people. It's not behind a screen hiding where you feel safe. It's having conversations face to face. And you know what? They may not be ready to receive Jesus. They may not be ready to take that step in their walk, in their life. And you know what? That's okay. You're still being faithful. You're still helping the fire spread. It's the Holy Spirit that prods the hearts of man and, and convicts them. It is our job to just share about how God has transformed our lives, how he has loved us and what he has done for us. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit works in that situation. Be bold. Don't hide behind a screen. Don't be scared to say something because you haven't in a while or you've been shot down a hundred times. Don't be afraid because there are people out there that are dying, that need Jesus, and we need to sometimes speak up. Sometimes we need to trust the advice of others. In this passage, we see Paul listening to his disciples. We see Paul listening to officials that are friends of his say, yo, Paul, hey, man, there's like thousands of people out there. May not be the best timing. May want to go hide back, not hide necessarily, but hang back and wait and just see what happens on this one. So he listens. He listens well. And despite what he may have been feeling emotionally and humanly, like wanting to get in there, oh, I got to defend, I got to stand up against that opposition, he trusts his friends and he hangs back. Sometimes we need to listen better. I don't know 
know about the other uh, wives in this place, but I am the type of wife that I'll come across a situation and I'll be struggling with something. I'll come home at the end of the day, we'll have dinner, Julie will go to bed and I'll be talking with John. I'll be like, you know, I'm really struggling with this. Da, 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 da. I'll go on and on and on and on, like I do. <laughs> and John will go, oh, here's some really great advice. And I'll go, oh, okay. And I'll go to bed. The next week, I'll get up in the morning, you know, get up, and I'm still struggling with the same thing. And that night after Jillian's in bed, I'll be like, John, you know, you know, we're still really struggling. Da, 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 da. Right, yeah, well, here's some really great advice. Oh, okay. You know, yeah, you said that last week. Okay, go to bed. <laughs> Three weeks, four weeks, something like that. It goes on and on, and I'm still drudging around like, oh, I can't figure this thing out. It's driving me nuts. I'll go to coffee with a friend. We'll be chatting, talking, and, and it'll inevitably come up and I'll say, you know, I've really been struggling with something and, and, you know, I just don't know what to do. And I've been talking to John about it and he's been giving me some advice, but, you know, it's probably good, but I'm just not sure. And then they'll give me some advice, right? And I don't know if any of you all have experienced this too. And maybe the men, I see maybe some men, you know, shaking their head up and down. Maybe you've experienced it with your wives, or maybe you've done the same thing to your wives. But I come home to John, and I'm like, guess what? I had an amazing time with my friend. I had wonderful coffee. It was great. We laughed. And you know what? I shared about my issue. She gave the best advice in the world. Let me share it with you. And of course, he looks at me. I've been telling you that for the past four weeks. What makes it so different that she said it, you know? And, and <laughs> inevitably, he's happy that I finally got it and the light bulb went off. But do you ever experience that where maybe someone in your life that God's trying to use to speak some truth into your life has been telling you over and over and over again the same thing? You're kind of like, oh. And then one day you'll hear it from a different perspective. You go, oh, okay. <laughs> I think that God puts people in our lives our spouses, our friends, maybe some random person. I've had that happen where I'm sitting there praying and God sends someone my way and says something and I'm like, whoa, that was you, God. Like something happens and, and God uses his people to sometimes tell us something that he wants us to know. And we have to listen to them because the truth is in moments of opposition, we have to listen to others around us sometimes, and he uses them as a source of accountability in our lives so that we don't get ourselves in trouble, so that we don't make the message of the gospel. Uh, you know, if he stepped in at this time and said something, it could have made things worse. It could have slowed the fire down if he went in heated or went in guns blazing kind of, no, believe in Jesus. You know, it, it, it could have caused more damage. Instead, he listened to friends, and he stayed where he was. And I'm guessing if they said, go in there, Paul, Go ahead and speak up. He, he would have listened. He would have gone and spoken. It would have been the right time. But God used those people to give good advice to Paul. And sometimes we need to listen to the advice of others when we're facing opposition. The third thing is sometimes we need to hang back. The advice was for Paul to hang back. Let's wait this one out. Hanging back does not mean that you're giving up. It does not mean that you're backing down from your faith. It doesn't mean anything like that. Hanging back does not mean that you're giving up and preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. It means that you realize that in your humanity, you cannot see everything as God sees it. We have blinders on. We can't see into the future. We can't see the underbelly of a situation or see above. He sees everything that's involved. And so if he leads us to hang back in a situation... That's because he's got something planned. He's working in another way. And in this passage, we see how he's working. We see that he's using the city's mayor to come up and say, you all are acting crazy. You're going to get in trouble yourselves by doing this. There is a legal way to go about this. I see nothing wrong with this. If they have a grievance against them, they can go and press charges. Otherwise, you guys are going to cause some issues here. So go, go ahead. You, just, just leave. And God used someone that wasn't a follower of the way to kind of talk some sense into a crazy riot and say, they're, they're not doing anything wrong. I don't see anything wrong here. You need, to, you need to just go home. And what happens? The fire continues to spread throughout Ephesus and throughout Asia as a result of the mayor speaking up and saying, you all need to chill. And as a result of Paul hanging back and letting God work in the ways that God can work. The fourth thing that we see is that we always, 
in all things. When we pray and seek God's guidance and how to stand against opposition, we just need to trust him to come through. Sometimes we feel inadequate. We don't know what to say when we speak up. We trust the Lord to come through and tell us what to say and use us as his vessel to speak his truth into someone's life, his love into someone's life. We just need to trust the Lord to come through, just like he did in the city's mayor, in the city of Clerk, that spoke up. We just need to pray. We need to trust. We need to keep the faith because he will come through. He may use you as a direct result in the fire spreading or in the direct result of standing up against opposition and seeing the opposition chill out. <laughs> he may say, you know what? Hang back. I got this one. Maybe you won't see a direct answer to prayer, but you keep being passionate. You keep spreading the word, and maybe you won't see the result of your stand here, but when you enter the gates of heaven, you'll see the result. You'll know that God has the victory. This morning, the bottom line to all this is Oh, yes, I don't know. I had the wrong thing. Okay, the bottom line of this is the truth of the gospel will always prevail. The truth of the gospel will always prevail when we spread the word of God. It, it, it will. It has. There has. The church has been persecuted for years and years and years, and the gospel still remains the same today. It is our truth that we hold on to. God promises us something that we can hold on to this morning because sometimes it's a tough pill to swallow, right? That we're going to face persecution, that we're going to face opposition if we call ourselves Christ followers. That's a tough pill to swallow. But we have to lean on God's promise that he will never leave us or forsake us. He is with us. And he promises us this beautiful truth in Matthew 5.10. Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for those, for theirs, excuse me, is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We have this eternal promise. If we trust in the Lord in all things, in good times and bad, when we're faced against opposition, faced with opposition or not, and we trust in Him. He never leaves us. He's always with us. We will not be in despair. We will not lose. We will not be abandoned. Instead, we will be blessed and ultimately blessed because he has prepared a place for us in the kingdom of heaven, a home where we will reside with him, worshiping him for all eternity. And I don't know about you, but anything that we'll face here is just a blip on the map. It's just, it's nothing compared to eternity, being in his presence in a place where there's no more fear, no more anger, no more crying, no more suffering, no more shame, none of that stuff, but instead eternal joy, basking in the presence of our wonderful savior. And that is our call as a Christian, to know that we are loved, that we are forgiven, that we are called, but also to endure and to keep moving forward no matter what we will face, because we know at the end we will be with him for all eternity. It is worth it all. Let's go ahead and pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have loved us. You, we thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for us and to bridge that gap between us and you, that our relationship that was broken could be restored and that us in our such a broken state, we could be forgiven, that you have mercy on us and you extend your grace to us, God, and that we, our relationship with you can be restored. And God, we realize we take on the responsibility in knowing that we're going to face opposition to our faith, God. But we know that you're calling us to spread the fire. We are know that you're calling us all to be lit matches, spreading the good news of Jesus and love and kindness and wisdom and boldness with those around us. And God, I pray that we would all be faithful and that we would be strong and that your Holy Spirit would be with us, giving us the strength and the courage to do so in times that is welcome freely in the times when we stand against an opposing force, God. Help us to be faithful to you knowing that you never leave us, you never forsake us, and you are waiting for us in eternity, God, where we will just bask in your presence for all time. God, thank you for preparing a place for us. Thank you that you have, are the victor, and we know that we have victory in you, Jesus. Thank you so much for that gift today, and we praise you, we thank you, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. 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 This morning you're dismissed. <laughs> and uh, just feel free to stay around, hang out, uh, grab some coffee, talk, pray with one another. This time is so valuable as a church family as we gather together. If you're wanting to be a part of VBS, it's going to be an awesome week. Uh, please join Dorothy for the meeting. And uh, we appreciate you.